Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and guests of the Munich Security Conference, welcome to this conversation of the Munich Security Conference with His Excellency Wang Yi, State Councillor and Foreign Minister of China. Welcome, Mr. Minister. We're delighted to have you with us today. Unfortunately, this year the pandemic has made it impossible for us to host a regular event in Munich, but we remain deeply committed to our core mission, namely to provide a global platform for informal but open and critical dialogue on important issues of international concern. In February, I was able to welcome virtually uh, uh, leaders for a special edition of the Munich Security Conference. This event was the kickoff for what we now call the Road to Munich. Common theme for all of our activities in coming months will be, will lay the groundwork for what I'm sure will be a very important next Munich Security Conference in February of 2022. Looking at the future means recognizing that um, the West uh, needs to take a fresh look at the rise of China and uh, how we can organize our relationship with China. The European Union has described in a, in a document already some time ago as a partner, a competitor, and also of a systemic rival. And in a strategy document issued by the United States government, China uh, was described as seeking unfair advantages, I'm quoting, behaves aggressively and undermines international rules and values, end of quote. On both sides of the Atlantic, the issue of treatment of ethnic minorities in certain areas of China, China's policy towards Hong Kong, activities in the South China Sea, etc., have been widely discussed and much criticized. For the first time since 1989, the European Union has recently imposed sanctions against China. And, and China has reacted with even stronger sanctions against the European Union, including against members of the European Parliament. At the same time, ladies and gentlemen, China is a very important trade and investment partner. It is also a very important partner regarding global challenges such as climate change, or defeating pandemics like the current COVID-19 pandemic. So the question is, are we on a collision course? How are we supposed to deal with the obvious differences while maintaining the necessary cooperative elements? We cannot answer this question without engaging directly with China. For us at the Munich Security Conference, as a global forum, dialogue, dialogue remains key. So this is why uh, I'm so happy to welcome His Excellency Foreign Minister, uh, Foreign Minister of China, to present uh, his perspective on these issues, on these uh, uh, critical issues, and others, I'm sure. Uh, in just a few minutes. We will also have comments from a European point of view. I would uh, like to offer a very warm welcome also to two uh, distinguished guests. First, Frederica Mogherini, former Vice President of the European Commission and EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security uh, Policy, and Sigma Gabriel, Chairman of Atlantic Brücke and former Vice Chancellor and Foreign Minister of Germany. On that note, uh, Sigmar Gabriel, 
thank you for the excellent cooperation with your organization in preparing this event. May I ask you for a brief word of welcome on behalf of Atlantic Book, please, uh, Sigma Gabri. Thank you very much, Excellency State Councillor and Minister for Foreign Affairs of the People's Republic of China, dear Wang Yi, dear Federica Magarini, and dear Ambassador Ischinger. First of all, on behalf of the Atlantic Brücke, I would like to thank Ambassador Ischinger and the Munich Security Conference for this event, which focuses on what is perhaps Europe's greatest challenge in this decade, Europe's relationship with the United States of America and the People's Republic of China. My special thanks go to, of course, His Excellency Wang Yi, and in the same to Federica Mogherini, who was the representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. Uh, both has, had accepted the invitation from Mr. Ambassador Ischinger and the MSC. Regardless of the question of where we have differences and conflicts with one another, none of the global challenges can be mastered and solved without China's contribution by it countering, be it countering climate change, the fight against pandemics, the fight against proliferation of nuclear weapons, conflict resolution, or the fight against hunger and poverty in the world, only if the United States, China, and Europe work together, these global challenges can be overcome. Without considering China's contribution, one can no longer discuss global issues in the 21st century. In addition, it's normal that one of the largest and most successful e economies in the world, a country with 1.4 billion inhabitants, is no longer satisfied with the role it played as a developing country in the post-war order of World War II. So the discussion with and about China must therefore always take a broad perspective and must not be narrowed down to individual fields as we often witness in the public debate. International politics and, above all, security policy, as it's in the core of the MSC, must, on the one and the, on the other hand, consider the entire spectrum of our relationships. Economic interests, international cooperation, as well as geopolitical rivalry, and the discussion of human rights, including individual human rights. But it should not be forgotten, and this also involves the right to a decent standard of living, and that China has achieved by this by lifting 800 million people out of bitter poverty. For this reason alone, I'm pleased, dear Wang Yi, to see you again at the Munich Security Conference, and I hope this will be not the last discussion about these big challenge for China, US, and especially Europe. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you very much, Sigma Gabriel. And now I have the privilege of offering the floor to His Excellency Wang Yi, State Councillor and Foreign Minister of China. Sir, you have the floor for your statement. Well, let me begin by thanking the Munich Security Conference MSC for hosting this conversation with China. And it gives me great pleasure to meet my three friends, old friends, by a video link. When I spoke at the MSC in February last year, China was in the middle of the fight against COVID-19. The global community gave us much valued support. I still remember at the time that Chairman Ischinger gave us strong encouragement. And that shall always remain deep in our heart. Now, one year on, the pandemic is still raging and bringing significant implication to the world and profound changes to humanity. As we continue to join hands both in fighting the pandemic and in ushering in a new future after COVID-19, it is high time that countries open up still further to each other and pursue even greater solidarity and cooperation. There have been some concerns expressed, including in Europe, 
about China's development path and foreign policy. While some are fair and reasonable, some are misgivings and misunderstandings. Chairman Ishinger already gave brief remarks. I think today is a good opportunity for me to give you China's perspective and then hear your thoughts. I have four main points to make. First, China's development is for progress of humanity, not a challenge or threat to the world. This year, we celebrate the 100 years of the founding of the Communist Party of China, CPC. To understand China's development, it is essential to have a good understanding of China's history and the CPC. As an ancient nation with a 5,000-year civilization, China has had its glory days and been through trials and tribulations. In modern times in particular, the Chinese nation was thrown almost to the brink of extinction as a result of aggression by imperialism and colonialism. To save the nation, our forefathers explored and exhausted almost all political models available at the time, including constitutional monarchy, parliamentarism, multi-party system, and presidential system, and yet all ended up in failure. Finally, it was the CPC that adapted Marxism to the Chinese context and rallied and led the Chinese people to achieve national independence and liberation. A right path was found to prosperity and strength a path of socialism with Chinese characteristics. In recent years, in particular, under the leadership of the CPC Central Committee with Comrade Xi Jinping at its core, China has scored a succession of historic achievements in its development, and socialism with Chinese characteristics has entered a new era. This is a path of development that features constant self-renewal. In just a few decades since the founding of New China, we managed to turn the country from being poor and weak into the second largest economy in the world. We have supported nearly 20% of the world's population with only 9% of the world's total arable land. We now have a middle-income group counting over 400 million people, and we have put in place the world's largest social security and compulsory education systems. For countries that have achieved modernization over the past centuries, their populations ranged from millions to tens of millions or hundreds of millions, to say the most. For China, the near completion of modernization with its 1.4 billion people is in itself a milestone in human development and more importantly a historic contribution to the progress of the world. This is a path of peace that features our firm commitment. As a country that has suffered so much from foreign aggression and expansion, China knows the value of peace. Hence. From the very beginning, we are determined not to tread on the beaten path of traditional powers. Instead, we are committed to an independent foreign policy of peace. For the last 70 plus years since the founding of the People's Republic, China has never started a war or encroached upon a single inch of foreign soil. China is the only country that has codified peaceful development in its constitution. China has a longer boundary, more neighboring countries, and more historical complications than any other country in the world. Through peaceful negotiations, China has delineated and demarcated boundaries with 12 of its 14 land neighbors. Regarding outstanding disputes over territorial and maritime rights and interests, China has pledged to seek negotiated settlement without resorting to the use or threat of force. In China's diplomatic vocabulary, there is no place for words like coercion or bullying. China is a fast-growing major country 
that is committed to peaceful coexistence with all countries and to non-hegemony, non-expansion and non-coercion. This is an irrefutable major contribution to global strategic stability. This is a path of cooperation that features benefits for the whole world. China has always embraced the world with open arms and acted as a trustworthy partner of the international community. In the wake of the European debt crisis, China firmly supported the Eurozone's response to the challenge. On climate change, China upholds the authority and effectiveness of the Paris Agreement. In the face of mounting protectionism, China has hosted the China International Import Expo for three years running to share its development opportunities with the rest of the world. We are committed to employing a shorter negative list and to putting in place a better business environment and even higher standard institutional opening up so that the China market will be more open to the world. Since the Belt and Road Initiative was launched seven years ago, China has registered more than 7.8 trillion US dollars in trade and 110 billion US dollars in direct investment with BRI partner countries, benefiting European companies, among others. The China Europe Railway Express, now in its 10th year and running some 1,000 services every month, has become a lifeline that connected countries as they fought COVID 19 and promoted recovery. A World Bank report suggests that by 2030, globally, the BRI could contribute to lifting 7.6 million people from extreme poverty and 32 million from moderate poverty. China's development has never been at the expense of other countries' interests. It has always focused on mutual benefit and cooperation. For over 10 years, China has contributed to more than 30% of global growth and more than 70% of global poverty reduction. Since 2008, China has received 25% of exports from the least developed countries and put off more loan repayment under the Debt Service Suspension Initiative for poorest countries than other G20 members. These are real efforts toward narrowing the North-South gap. During the COVID pandemic, China has provided urgently needed supplies to 150 plus countries and 13 international organizations, including more than 280 billion masks, 3.4 billion protective suits, and 4 billion testing kits. China is the first to pledge making vaccines a global public good and has so far provided 300 million doses to the world. At the recent Global Health Summit, President Xi Jinping announced five new measures, including providing financial aid, supplying vaccines, carrying out joint vaccine production, and waiving intellectual property rights on vaccines. These measures will lend a strong impetus to the building of a global community of health for all. That said, China's development remains a long and arduous journey. Our per capita GDP, just a little over 10,000 US dollars, ranks after the 60th in the world, far behind most European countries including Germany and Italy. The primary task for this biggest developing country in the world is to concentrate on developing itself and addressing the principal contradiction between China's unbalanced and inadequate development and the Chinese people's ever-growing needs for a better life. Our plan is to foster a new development paradigm, advance reform and opening up of a higher standard, and pursue win-win cooperation of higher quality. China will achieve even better development and the world will become a better place 
with China's development. Second, China is a trustworthy partner of all countries, not a systemic rival locked in confrontation. In recent years, some have talked about China's successful path and system as being a shock and threat to the West. In Europe, quite some people have defined China as a systemic rival. This is something we cannot agree with. As for what system a country may adopt, there is no one-size-fits-all model. Countries differ in history, culture, and social system. Just like the food that is different in the Chinese and Western cuisines that use either chopsticks or knife and fo fork, each is there for its own particular reason. Different social systems do not necessarily make countries rivals, nor do different development paths entail sure obstruction to mutually beneficial cooperation. Over the past decades, China's relations with the West have, on the whole, maintained a momentum of cooperation, and that has enormously benefited both sides and beyond. The first Western country to establish diplomatic relations with China was from Europe, and European countries almost all voted in favor of restoring China's lawful seat in the United Nations 50 years ago. When China and European Union established comprehensive strategic partnership in 2003, European countries had the knowledge that they were engaging a country with a much different system, and it did not stop Europe from making the right and independent decision. What it fully demonstrates is that as long as countries respect each other and pursue mutually beneficial cooperation, they could rise above their different systems. Today, several decades on, the only thing that is different with China is its development. The West would seem rather narrow-minded should it choose to view China as a rival and threat because of its development. For China, we have always been confident in our own system and inclusive toward other cultures. China will stick to the system and development path it has chosen because it is a successful one, it is the right one, and it has the support of the Chinese people. At the same time, China fully respects the independent choices of other countries. China will never export its system or engage in systemic competition. We always believe that diversity is a defining feature of human society, and pluralism is an important driver behind global development. Different systems can all succeed through mutual accommodation and mutual learning. Some people, out of certain intention, have tried to portray China's relations with the West as a competition between democracy and authoritarianism. Such an act of drawing lines between values is hardly objective, rational, or democratic. Does humanity have shared values? Yes. China believes that the values of peace, development, equity, justice, democracy, and freedom are all shared values of humanity and the common goals of all countries. They must not, however, be labeled as the patent of only a few countries in the world. Since the CPC was founded, it has been committed to pursuing democracy and freedom for the Chinese people. Upholding and protecting human rights has been written into the Constitution of the People's Republic of China. As countries differ in national realities, the practices of democracy and human rights also vary from country to country. And the key judgment is whether the people are satisfied and happy. This is the most important thing. How is China doing on human rights? 
No one is a better judge than the Chinese people themselves. As was mentioned previously, in the last seven decades and more, over 800 million Chinese have been lifted out of poverty, and average life expectancy has surged from 35 to 77 years. With its Human Development Index rising from 0.410 in 1978 to 0.758 in 2018, China is the only country that has completed the transition from low to high human development since the UN launched the index. And over the years, many independent opinion polls conducted by Western research institutes, the independent opinion polls, including those in the U.S. and other countries, have invariably placed the approval and satisfaction ratings of the CPC and the Chinese government among the Chinese people at the top of world rankings. The support is over 90 or 95 percent. And these are the result by foreign independent opinion polls. Just now, um, Xinjiang was also mentioned. It, I know this is of much interest to many. Xinjiang has seen substantial development in human rights. Its GDP has grown from over, grown over 200 times or nearly 40 times in per capita terms. More than 3 million people have graduated from poverty in Xinjiang. Between 2007 and 2018, the Uyghur population in Xinjiang have grown by over 3 million or 31.8 percent. The allegation of a genocide in Xinjiang is against the facts and common sense. It is also astray from human intelligence and conscience. Many foreign friends who have been to Xinjiang have openly denounced such allegations. Third, China is ready to work with countries in Europe and the wider world to practice true multilateralism and uphold the UN-centered international system. The principle lying at the core of the existing international system and order is multilateralism. When multilateralism is well observed, the well-being of humanity gets preserved and advanced. When multilateralism is under attack, chaos breaks out and the law of the jungle returns. The past few years saw unilateralism running unchecked. A superpower had chosen to put its own interests above other things. It turned its back on a host of international organizations and treaties and wielded the stick of unilateral sanctions, causing serious disruption to international order and global governance. Against such a backdrop, China and Europe rose to the challenge. Together, our two sides defended multilateralism with concrete actions and prevented the world from heading toward confrontation and division. Today, in a world experiencing changes and a pandemic both unseen in a century, the 193 UN member states must not see themselves as 193 separate boats, but 193 sailors on board the same boat. To successfully navigate rapids and hidden shoals, we must pull together in solidarity, stay united for multilateralism, and heighten the awareness that we are a community with a shared future. Here comes the questions. What is multilateralism? And how to practice multilateralism? We welcome discussions among countries. In China's view, true multilateralism cannot be achieved without the UN and a firm commitment to upholding the UN-centered international system. 
True multilateralism cannot be achieved without international law and a firm commitment to maintaining the international order built upon it. And true multilateralism cannot be achieved without international cooperation and a commitment of major countries to lead by example in upholding justice, following the rule of law, undertaking responsibilities and focusing on actions. We must guard against pseudo-multilateralism. Sheer talk of returning to multilateralism may hide a real scheme to form small circles and conduct group politics, and to even divide the world along ideological lines and force countries to pick sides. We have heard talks about the need to uphold the rules-based international order. Well, the crux of the matter is what kind of rules are being talked about. If they mean the UN Charter and international law, then repetitious reference of the rules sound rather redundant. We can just say the international order based on international law. If they only mean rules set by several or a group of countries, that would amount to imposing the will of the minority on the majority. This is not true multilateralism. Practice is the sole criterion for testing truth. To judge whether a country is truly practicing and upholding multilateralism, one must look at what it is doing. As the first country to put its signature on the UN Charter, China has joined almost all intergovernmental organizations and over 500 international treaties. We have never walked away from international obligations, never asked others to pick size, or owed arrears to the UN or any other international organization. China has remained a doer in the various undertakings of the organization. China is now the second largest funding contributor to both the UN and its peacekeeping operations and the top contributor of peacekeeping personnel among the permanent members of the Security Council. Since its accession to the WTO, China has cut its overall tariff rate to below 7.5 percent, much lower than the promise we made during the accession and lower than most countries in the world. China has shortened its negative list on market access from about 100 to 33 items. And the this environment has been steadily improving. China has become one of the most open countries in the world. China and Europe are two major forces for multilateralism. Upholding multilateralism has been one of our most important common understanding and shared responsibilities. Madame Magrini once said that multilateralism is a European DNA and that China and the EU should adhere to multilateralism and play the role of a stabilizer in the world. I very much agree with her observation. China hopes to work with the EU to set example for upholding and practicing multilateralism. Well, the last point, fourth. China is ready to maintain and expand all-round cooperation with Europe in the spirit of mutual respect and mutual benefit. Now there are different kinds of talks about the nature of China-EU relationship. Is it one of competition, confrontation or cooperation? Are the two each other's rivals, threats or partners? China's position is consistent. We view relations with the EU from a strategic height. We see cooperation as the overall direction and keynote of the China-EU relations and we see EU Europe as a partner, not a rival. We will continue to support the European integration process, support the EU in gaining greater unity, strength and strategic independence and in playing a bigger role in the world. We also stand ready to expand all round cooperation with Europe on the basis of mutual respect and mutual benefit. The top priority is to step up cooperation against COVID-19. 
An ongoing pandemic with many twists and turns is the biggest challenge to the international community. It is important that our two sides continue to lead global cooperation. The two sides may work more closely on the development and production of vaccines and support the WHO and Gavi in playing their role and oppose the politicization of vaccines and vaccine nationalism. We also need to promote more fair and equitable distribution of vaccines and help developing countries enhance anti-epidemic capacity. Second, we need to enhance coordination on macro policies to boost global economic recovery. Now, the world economy faces multiple challenges, including the pandemic and looming inflationary pressures. As two major economies, we need to adopt responsible macroeconomic and financial policies, watch out for financial risks, oppose protectionism, and keep global industrial chains and supply chains unclogged. These efforts will help increase certainty in economic recovery. The European Parliament recently passed a motion pushing for the freeze of the EU's investment agreement with China, citing Xinjiang as the reason. I wish to stress that with a high level of mutual benefit, the investment agreement is not a one-sided favor. The Xinjiang-related issue bears on China's sovereignty and security. Attempts by some in the EU to link up issues of different nature and turn trade issues into political ones are not acceptable and would lead nowhere. Cooperation between China and Europe represents the overriding trend, stoking political confrontation and economic decoupling between our two sides does not serve Europe's interests and will not go very far. Third, we need to enhance green and digital cooperation. Green economy and digital economy represent the future of humanity. Our two sides have forged partnerships for green and digital cooperation. And we need to increase exchanges and cooperation in circular economy, clean energy and biodiversity, and offer mutual support to each other's environmental agenda. We could also seek greater complementarity in areas such as digital economy, big data, cloud computing, artificial intelligence and technical rules and standards, promote the rule making of global digital governance and work together for a community with a shared future in cyberspace featuring peace, security, openness, cooperation and order. China has proposed the Global Initiative on Data Security and we will be happy to hear good suggestions from the EU side. Fourth, we need to strengthen global governance to jointly address global challenges. Now, the reform of global governance has entered a deep water zone. China and the EU need to step up communication within multilateral frameworks, including the UN, WTO and WHO, in a bid to make the global governance system more fair and equitable. At a recent video summit, leaders of China, France and Germany reached strategic consensus on climate change and other important topics. There should be further communication and cooperation to follow that through. We would also like to promote the political settlement of hotspot issues, including the Iranian nuclear issue and those related to Syria, Palestine, Israel and the Middle East for the benefit of regional peace and stability. Fifth, we need to encourage people to people and civilizational exchanges. China and Europe are two proud civilizations and there are many widely told stories. We need to encourage more cultural, educational, academic and media exchanges to better understand each other and bring our peoples closer. Such exchanges will also help prevent disinformation from covering up truth and political virus from eroding solidarity. That will also cement the popular and social foundation for the steady growth of this relationship. Europe is the birthplace of the Olympic spirit. Our two sides may stand together in denouncing politicization of sports. China welcomes European countries to the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing and Chinese audience are looking forward to cheering up for the excellent performance of European athletes well, thank you for your patience. Now I look forward to my old friend's comments and would love to take whatever questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, uh.
good friend, uh, Foreign Minister uh, Wang Yi. Thank you for this very comprehensive statement. Uh, I'm now going to uh, hand over directly first to Federica Mogherini for her initial comment and then to uh, Sigma Gabriel, and then we'll take it from there and uh, look at some of the questions that have been submitted by our by members of the audience. So Federica, why don't you go ahead first, please? Thank you very much. Let me start by uh, thanking you, uh, the Munich Security Conference, and uh, uh, saying how happy I am to uh, see again my old friend and uh, State Councillor and Minister uh, Wang Yi, uh, and also Sigmar. Uh, great to see you again. Uh, it is a, a good opportunity, I think, to, to have a, 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 a not only comprehensive, but also a, a very frank and open discussion, as it is always uh, in the spirit of the Munich Security Conference, and uh, as we always did, uh, during the years of uh, cooperation we have shared. Uh, and uh, I believe that you have given us uh, a very clear and detailed um, picture and framework of where China stands uh, today, uh, coming from far away, as you recalled, uh, but also uh, with the current positions that, uh, that China uh, has. And also uh, you made, I think, very clear some of the worries that China identifies in the global trends and dynamics uh, that are um, developing in these uh, months. Uh, I believe that I was listening to you very carefully and I, I thought how many times we went through some of these topics in our dialogues, being them bilateral or public. And I think that we, we all know very well, uh, and the Munich Security Conference audience also, I think, knows very well, which are the points on which we disagree. Uh, and uh, we probably would not uh, come to an agreement uh, in uh, 10 or 15 minutes uh, of an online meeting. Uh, I think that um, yet uh, what would be interesting now to understand, and this would be my question for you, in a moment when the global trends uh, are shifting somehow, but not in a completely clear direction yet, to understand uh, to what extent um, this space for cooperation between uh, Europe and China uh, is actually real and on what topic or topics this can be real. I have to admit, I'm often asked uh, by students, now I'm the rector at the College of Europe, uh, including some Chinese students we have there, uh, in Bruges, uh, I'm often asked uh, about this triple definition that Europe had uh, about partnership with China, being a strategic partner on some issues, a competitor on some other issues, and namely on economic issues, on some economic and trade issues, and, and then uh, this, this definition of systemic rival. And I always explain that when this document was adopted in 2019, that remember we discussed this at, at length, it was, by the way, just before one of the most productive summits we had, uh, in, uh, uh, in Brussels in 2019, um, but this to, to say that cooperation is possible even after hard exchanges. Uh, the important thing, as you said, is to be clear and respectful uh, and, uh, and to put everything on the table in, uh, in an honest manner. But uh, I, I, I very well remember that in, in those years, in, in that time, it was very clear to all of us which were the issues on which uh, cooperation was not only possible but even uh, vital for the international system. You mentioned climate change, I would add the Iran nuclear deal and some other key elements of the UN system that you mentioned also. Um, and as I said, I think we all know which are the fields on which competition is there and, and rivalry is there. Uh, my, my question to you, and it's a question also for, for all of us, I think, uh, which are the fields on which you see cooperation possibly increasing? today and in the coming years, because the trend doesn't seem to go in that direction. Uh, some argue that we only have climate change left, basically, <laughs> to cooperate on. Uh, and I think that the management of the, uh, of, uh, of the pandemic uh, has represented at first an opportunity for international and global cooperation. But we've also seen uh, dynamics that have been different. Um, the use of aid or sanitary support uh, twisted uh, for political or communication reasons from different sides. Uh, and uh, I am afraid that the opportunity of understanding that we are on the same boat, as you put it, uh, might slip away uh, in, in the current uh, geopolitical dynamics. 
I still believe that Europe understands that dialogue is a must and cooperation in all fields where this is possible, and not in all fields it is possible, uh, is better than confrontation. As you said, this is in, in the European DNA. But it seems to me that the areas for practical cooperation, for real cooperation, uh, beyond the, the narrative, beyond the, the, the key words we, we use, uh, is shrinking. Uh, which areas for cooperation would you identify for the present and the future of, of the relations between China and Europe? Uh, well, we'll go straight to Sigma Gabriel, and, uh, and then maybe I will offer one of the uh, additional questions from the audience, and then we'll go back to uh, for Mr. Wang. Sigma Gabriel, please. Thanks. Maybe I should follow the, the wave Federica discussed it uh, now because, I mean, to be very honest, Europe is in a bit is, is, is sitting between two chairs. On the one hand side, uh, when it comes to our political system, to our idea of uh, our uh, society, we we and China are opponents. And when it comes to um, global challenges and uh, economics, we are partners. Some call it a kind of frenemy friend and enemy at the same time so um, uh, that, and maybe I, I, it will be our position for the next 10 years and what F F federica asks is where europe can make a, a, a difference when it comes to develop more international cooperation which is in the interest as well as in the interest of china and the us and europe and there I want to pick up the idea of uh, and the question of our friend Wang Yi. What is multilateralism about? I think multilateralism is surely not the rule of the minority above the majority. There you are absolutely right. But it's also not the opposite. Multilateralism means not the rule of the majority above the minority. Multilateralism means that by international treaties, international cooperation and at the best international institutions the rule of the strongest should be replaced by the rule of law it's about a fair framework with uh, the same rights and responsibilities for all countries and this includes by the way to respect the international bill of human rights as individual rights as well as, as social rights in this respect, Europe and the United States also share the idea of a world order in this interpretation of multilateralism. Um, without, uh, by the way, the rise of China in the last few decades would hardly have been possible so quickly. In essence, the idea is the, of this order is that treaties and international institutions should peacefully regulate and resolve the world's conflicts. Uh, without increasing confrontation because disputes and conflicts between individual nation states or regions in the world can always arise. Uh, we will not see a world without conflicts. However, if they are to be dealt with peacefully and not turn into a conflict, a common framework and above all neutral international institutions are required. Today we are experiencing that the existing institutions either no longer take account of the international conditions that have changed significantly since the end of the 20th century and are in need of reform or simply toothless tigers or even completely absent. My first question to our guests, Minister Wang Yi is therefore whether China could conceive of joining this idea of an international institutional framework and thereby strengthen international agreements and organizations such as WTO, where we have a huge reform necessity, the WHO, for example, but also international jurisdictions in the coming years. And to what extent does this idea contradict the idea of non-interference in the internal affairs of a nation which China regards as indispensable. Sigma Gabriel. Um, I've just been informed uh, by Foreign Minister Wang's team that it would be okay if we go into a few minutes over time because we are already under serious time pressures uh, 
the statement by Foreign Minister Wang has taken up a, a good amount of our allotted time. So we will go into some overtime. I know that Federica Mogherini will have to leave us precisely on time in something like 10 minutes or so. So um, if you agree, let before offering the floor again to Minister uh, Wang, let me add one question that's been submitted by the from the audience. And this is a question, Minister, which comes from a member of the European Parliament. And you will not be surprised by the uh, direction of this question. So if, with your permission, I'll read it to you. Relations between Europe and China are very strained. In March, the European Union sanctioned a small number of individuals in China with regard to the situation in Xinjiang. The Chinese government reacted by sanctioning a large number of EU institutions and individuals. How will China be able to have a positive relationship with the European Union if it sanctions key institutions of the European Union? Question mark. End of quote. So at this point, if I may offer the floor to the minister for his first response, and then hopefully we'll have enough time to go into some of the additional questions that, that have been submitted. Minister, you have the floor. Good. Indeed, time is really limited here. I very much hope sometime in the future we can have a more in-depth discussion with my old friends. On the question by Madam Magrini, well, a good news to you, the JCPOA has the possibility of a revival. We are working together, including with my uh, Vice Minister, Mr. Ma Zhao Xu. He is directly in charge of this issue. He's working very hard, and this is an important outcome for China and EU joining hands in upholding multilateralism. We are working hard to uphold this agreement and the authority of the UNSC resolution and peace and stability in the Middle East. On your specific question about the uh, scope or space of a China-Europe cooperation. Um, you mentioned only maybe only climate change. Well, I, the way I see it, we have at least eight major areas of cooperation. First, COVID response. This will last for quite some time. And also climate change. We need to work together to prevent the next epidemic because it may strike anywhere, anytime in the world. We should always be prepared. This is the shared responsibility of China and the EU. The third area is economic recovery. Not just in China and Europe, but across the world particular in many developing and least developed countries, COVID has taken a heavy toll. Without their recovery, there will be a big drag on world recovery. And the fourth area is counterterrorism in all their forms. Terrorism remains the most pressing and uh, major threat facing all mankind. Now, the U.S. is withdrawing its troops from Afghanistan, but terrorism still exists and may even come back with greater vengeance. So it is important that we work together to combat terrorism and extremist ideology. The next area is improving global governance. We talked about WTO reform and also strengthening the role of the WHO. Globalization has created a lot of wealth. It has also resulted in imbalance within and among countries. 
It is important that we improve global governance to steer globalization in a direction that is more open and beneficial for all. We cannot just let some countries become the winners of globalization while others are losing from globalization. This is not fair. The sixth area of cooperation is joint efforts to help the least developed countries. Most of uh, these countries are in Africa. We would like to work with the EU and also Germany, France and Italy and other European countries to carry out tripartite cooperation. We can each, each leverage our own strength. For instance, in China, we have the strength in manufacturing and training of human resources. The EU has a strength in capital and in technology. When we work together, we can have a multiplying effect. The seventh is a resolution of hotspot issues on the conflict between Palestine and Israel at the UN Security Council. China had very close cooperation with Norway and also Tunisia. Our three countries worked very closely with each other to work for consensus at the Council. Because of the opposition of the US, a presidential uh, a chair's statement has been stalled and delayed, but with the joint effort, a ceasefire has been realized bring some hope to the Palestinians. And the next area of cooperation is strengthening the role of the UN. Its dual role has not been fully leveraged and the purposes and principles of the UN Charter have not been fully implemented. We need to uphold the authority of the UN and support its charter. And Burn out its and delivered on the ground humanity. So just, uh, the top of my head, we have uh, so many areas of cooperation. We do admit there are differences and disagreements between the two sides, mostly in how we see democracy and human rights. Is there democracy in China? I talked about the international opinion polls. One is by Harvard University. The team has done a 13 year long survey, independent survey in China, and their conclusion is very clear. That is, over 95% of the Chinese people are supportive of the Chinese government and the governing party. In other words, their needs are met by the government and they are happy and content with their life in China. Isn't this democracy? Isn't this what democracy is about? There are different means to democracy. But what matters is the result. If the people are happy with it, this is democracy. And talking about human rights, human rights are codified in China's law, the protection of human rights. If there is no protection of human rights, would we have gone this far in our development and in our progress. We wouldn't have achieved so much. In China, we are doing everything we can to promote democracy and human rights. It is important that we have more communication to dispel some misgivings or misunderstanding. One thing is very important. No one should see others with their own standards. Maybe the Europeans have their own understanding of democracy or human rights, but the Chinese people have their own 
understanding, have our own understanding of democracy and human rights. So it is important to have such communication instead of imposing one's own standards on others. With that cleared away, there are not many challenges between us or differences between us. We would like to have more dialogue with the European side on human rights based on equality. And also on the question raised by Mr. Gabriel, uh, the international organization's role have not been fully uh, brought out. Actually, I mentioned just now the UN has not been fully utilized. If all countries can support the UN and observe the UN Charter, then the world will be a more peaceful place and will be a better place. The pressing task now is how we can work together to ensure that the UN can fully live up to its role, to leverage its role, to make sure that the UN Charter can fully play its role. That is important. The main entities of the international law have increased during the recent decades, and many of them are African countries. Many of them gained independence in the 20th century. So indeed, reform of international institutions is necessary with a view to increasing the representation and say of developing countries. And this will help fully leverage the role of the UN system. The humanity has gone through two world wars, and countries worked it together to formulate the UN Charter and some basic norms in international relations. And these shall be adhered to. And these include equality of all kinds, regardless of their size the principle of non-interference in other countries' internal affairs, and these shall be upheld. Otherwise, the world could return to the old days of the rules of the jungle, the days when the might was right. We don't think that is the trend for the future, and another principle, of course, is peaceful settlement of disputes. And all these shall be upheld and adhered to. Mr. First and foremost, multilaterally means global affairs shall be handled by all countries. They shall not be determined by one or two countries. All countries stand as equals. Secondly, each and every country has the right to development. Development is not an exclusive right to a few certain countries. It doesn't mean a country must have supremacy over others. Every country is entitled to better development. During the past decades, developed countries realized their development. And now the developing countries have the right to develop as well. Thirdly, every country has its own national realities. And every country has the right to pursue a development path in light of its national realities and has the support of its people. I think these are basic three points of multilateralism. And on that basis, we could promote democracy in international relations and move toward a multipolar world. And then, of course, there comes the question, if every country has a right to development, if every country has a say, then what is the standard? 
what is the criteria for right and wrong, then it is international law. So to make sure that multilateralism can deliver, we need all countries to keep to international law and the basic norms governing international relations. So if we can combine multilateralism and international law, I believe basically all questions and challenges that the world faces can be resolved. Upholding basic norms of international relations and international law includes adherence to the principle of non-interference. So keeping to the current international system and the non-interference in internal affairs actually do not contradict each other. And uh, Chairman Ishinger, you have uh, raised a question on behalf of the audience. The question is about relations between Europe and China. Well, first I want to say that it has never come to our mind that EU will put sanctions on us. The EU and China, we are comprehensive strategic partners. How is that possible for comprehensive strategic partners to put sanctions on each other? So the Chinese side was shocked when the EU made the decision to impose sanctions on us. And I'm afraid the EU sanctions were not firmly grounded in realities. They were basically based on so-called evidence from a few individuals. And the EU never communicated with the Chinese government about whether or not those evidence was true. And the EU sanctions were not ratified by the United Nations which means they were not firmly grounded in international law. And I have to tell you, my friends, when those EU sanctions were launched, the Chinese people were reminded of the days when we were bullied by European imperialists. So when the news was released, there was a strong public opinion in the Chinese society. And as the Chinese government, we have our sovereignty to uphold. We have our national dignity to uphold. We have to let people know the truth, the facts. We must push back falsehoods and disinformation. So we have to make some response. We were unwilling to do so, but we were not the first to launch the issue. If there were no EU sanctions, we wouldn't have rolled out our sanctions. Having said that, I must say that China-EU relations have the basis that has been built over the past decades and they won't, wouldn't be derailed because of one or two sanctions. I still have confidence in our relationship. I believe we will be able to overcome the temporary difficulties through dialogue and communication. In the end, we must and we can work together for the benefit of this world. We can do more concrete good things for this world. So these are my response. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister. Uh, this seems to be really one of the areas where there is serious disagreement, uh, uh, certainly at the level of the European Parliament uh, on the one hand, and uh, uh, your government, the leadership of China on the other hand, which is why I would like to go uh, to, to continue uh, simply and uh, present to you yet another question on this uh, on this area of, of uh, dispute of disagreement. Uh, this is another question that comes from the European Parliament and uh, again let me quote, the European Union has decided 
to pause all work on ratifying the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. Aside from the sanctions on the European Union, another sticking point is that China has not ratified fundamental conventions of the International Labour Organization related to forced labour. Do you think China will move towards ratifying these? Question mark. This is the, the first question. And since we are running out of time with your permission, let me just add another question which has been submitted by a university student, uh, which um, is related uh, to this. Uh, I quote, why is, I mean, you have actually responded to this question already, Minister, but I'm repeating it anyway. Uh, why is the situation in Xinjiang not a legitimate area of concern for Europe as seen uh, by China? And why has China, China's response to the expression of international concerns on this issue been so hostile? Question mark. So, these are two questions. Uh, let me just simply explain that Federica Mogherini already had to leave. Uh, we knew that she ha only had time until three o'clock. I'm delighted to see that you, Minister, uh, are willing to add a few minutes. So uh, I think after these uh, questions, we will need to come to uh, the conclusion. And I would then hand over for a few uh, uh, concluding remarks by Sigma Gabriel after your response. Minister, please. Well, these are good questions. It's uh, good that you have raised these questions and I would be happy to give some explanation. First, on forced labor, there is no forced labor in China. The Communist Party of China has been governing in China for a hundred years, most importantly because we are people-centered. We have always proceeded from the interests of the people. There is simply no such thing as forced labor in China. It's against the philosophy of a party. And also in China's law, it is strictly forbidden. And third, China has acceded to 22 conventions of the ILO. Now, there are only two conventions that we have yet to join. The work is underway. We are studying and working to ratify these two conventions. In the BIT negotiations with the EU, we agreed in explicit terms that the parties are committed to advancing the ratification of relevant ILO conventions. As to whether and when joining the conventions, this is not a prerequisite or precondition of BIT negotiations. It's not these two, it's not that we will not r ratify BIT if China does not join the ILO at a date. Well, on China's part, we are doing when to ratify ILO conventions, but again, that a prerequisite BIT if there's external political from the that may be counterproductive to China's ratification of the ILO conventions. China has its own dignity. We will not cave in to external political pressure. We have our own pace. 
we are doing according to our own way, but not yielding to any external pressure. It is regrettable that the European Parliament has uh, pushed for the freeze of the BIT ratification, but it is not a one-sided favor. Like I said in the remarks previously, it serves the benefits of both sides. The EU is a comprehensive strategic partner of China's, and in the negotiation, China's offer has the lowest market access and highest standard of opening up to date. This actually serves the trade and investment cooperation between China and Europe. If it is blocked, it serves the interests of neither side. It is not in the interest of, Europe, of the European side. And also, on Xinjiang, these are two completely different issues and should not be linked up in any politicization attempt. The business cooperation, including BIT, should not be held hostage by the different opinions politically, like the Singapore scholar Mr. Kishore Mababani said, it's like shooting oneself in, its, um, in his feet. It's not constructive at all. We hope to have more communication with the European side to work out these differences and to work for the early ratification of the BIT and to let it benefit the business community on both sides and also the people on both sides. On the last question, why can't the EU show interest in Xinjiang? Why is China antagonistic on that? It's not China that has antagonism on that. It is some others who are antagonistic against China are making an issue of Xinjiang. A former senior official of the US has already admitted in a video speech that the best way to destabilize China is to provoke tension among the Uyghurs and that will create chaos in China and bring instability in China. They themselves have admitted that in public statements. So the Xinjiang issue is not about democracy, human rights or religion. Not at all. Since day one, it is an issue about counter-terrorism. Xinjiang borders Afghanistan. And years ago, it is through Xinjiang that those terrorists infiltrated into China. And Xinjiang saw many terrorist attacks. And the Chinese government has to do something to respond to crack down on the terrorists. And we're also taking preventive measures, including education, to de-radicalize and to move people away from extremist ideology and to remove the breeding ground for terrorism. That is something advocated by the UN, including in an action plan of the UN that encourages countries to take education measures to remove the breeding ground. And we have drawn upon experience from the UK, France, and Germany. In the UK, they have the DPP project and also community correction. They are essentially the same. That is, 
through education, we try to change their mindset to remove the terrorist ideology. That's what Xinjiang has been doing and has produced good effect. There have not been terrorist attacks in Xinjiang for more than four years. The people there are now able to enjoy stable and happy lives. This is something good. There's no such thing as concentration camp in Xinjiang. And many of the pictures are actually pictures of the schools, government venues, and been to China. Many places have high walls. It's a custom or habit of the Chinese people. They are not concentration camps. Not facts. And there's no such thing as one million people being detained. They are fabricated by some scholars who are against China. And there's no thing as genocide. The Our European friends know what is genocide? And in Xinjiang, the population has grown a lot. There's no such thing as genocide. And in China, there are many favorable policies in terms of education, employment, regarding the ethnic groups. All of those are lies and rumors. Why would people make up those lies? Some are driven by biases against China and some are driven by a hidden agenda. The purpose is to destabilize Xinjiang and then China. And then they could hold China back. They could stop China's development. They are unwilling to see China, a country with 1.4 billion people, developing in a smooth way. And that is something we will not say yes. As I said, China has the right to better development, and China's development will contribute to the development of humanity. China has no hostility toward any other country or any other person. And we have hosted nearly 740 press conferences to uh, tell people about development. And we have uh, disclosed the reality against those falsehoods and lies produced by those so-called witnesses. And there is no such thing as uh, people being persecuted. If others still choose not to believe us, then they can come to Xinjiang. They can see reality with their own eyes, and they could ask questions themselves. We won't prevent them from doing so. And I can tell you, my old friends, up to now, there are over 1,000 scholars, government officials, uh, Muslim religious figures from over 90 countries who have visited Xinjiang. We have received them in Xinjiang and from different social backgrounds. They have different professions. And one common conclusion of all of them after their visit to Xinjiang is that what they have seen in Xinjiang is 100% totally different from what they have read from Western media reports. So the message is we welcome international friends. We welcome European ambassadors and diplomatic envoys in Beijing to visit Xinjiang. But some of them are reluctant to come. We can wait. Then they make the decision. Make the decision. They could go to Xinjiang and have a look. On matters related to Xinjiang, China has nothing to hide. Xinjiang has enjoyed such remarkable development. We believe anyone who has come to visit Xinjiang will see this and we'll see that our Xinjiang policy has the support of the 
whole nation. Um, I've been making many points, so uh, Chairman Ishinger, you have the floor. You have the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I know that Sigma Gabriel is also under uh, significant time pressure. So while I want to add a word or two at, uh, at the very end, I want to give him the floor now so that he can offer his concluding uh, remarks. And with your permission, Minister, I would then close the session with just a couple of, uh, uh, of observations. Sigma Gabriel, please. Yes, of course. I mean, it's, it's impossible to, um, to, to come to a conclusion after this debate. And I think we all were aware that it's not possible in one and a half hours to have a deep dive in all of uh, our different um, challenges, uh, especially between Europe, US and China. But what the discussion shows is how necessary it is that fora like the Munich Security Conference is inviting uh, our friends from China as well as from other parts of the world to discuss in a very open and frank atmosphere all our um, differences, hopefully also um, as well uh, common opportunities and responsibilities. And I very much have to thank our special guests, the State Councillor and Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, our friend Wang Yi, that he was willing to follow the invitation and to discuss with first, uh, and about some sometimes very difficult questions and issues. Uh, but that's the way I remember our last meetings, uh, 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 Excellency Wang Yi, you were never afraid to, to, to start a difficult debate. Uh, and I hope that um, Wolfgang Ischiger, Federica Mogherini and others will invite you, as well as our American friends and other friends from Europe, to further debate uh, our future responsibilities, as well as maybe red lines where we will not convince our partners uh, to step to come step by step to a global order which is not the G zero world like Ian Bre brother uh, Ian Bremer said, but a world where we can uh, rely on stable international frameworks and uh, international institutions. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ambassador Ishinger, for this very interesting event, and all the best to Wang Yi and of course also to Federica. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much for your for your participation and for this uh, final comment. And um, in conclusion, uh, uh, Minister uh, Wang, let me just offer uh, two or three brief observations. First, uh, let me add my voice to what Sigma Gabriel has just said. I think this conversation deserves to be continued. And of course, the best place to continue it would be the next physical Munich Security Conference. And I hope you personally will be in a position to join us again uh, next February. Um, we may also be uh, capable in um, developing other discussion formats, whether virtual or, uh, or physical, to continue the, the debate between Europe and China, between the West and China. I think, and this discussion has demonstrated it, uh, this discussion is more necessary than maybe was the case 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, because uh, public perceptions have changed. The role of China has changed. China is now one of the two most powerful nations in the, in the world, quite clearly. Um, and um, this is why there, there are multiple uh, questions and uh, apprehensions and uh, concerns. And uh, if we can make a contribution as a, as a, as a uh, non-partisan format, we, the Munich Security Conference, we will certainly want to do that. So you and other leaders of uh, Chinese government and uh, uh, have a standing invitation, of course, to, uh, to continue this discussion. Second observation, quite frankly, the script I have in front of me contains a significant number of questions which I was now not able to present to you because we ran out of time, but simply to uh, 
to signal to you that there was a question, for example, on the future of arms control and whether China would, under what conditions China might be willing to enter into serious arms control negotiations with other uh, big powers. There was a question, and I think these are all very interesting questions, there was a question on the global initiative on data security, which China launched uh, last year. Uh, there was a question on China's announcement of wanting to be climate neutral by 2060 and how that uh, could be achieved uh, uh, if China continues to have fossil fuel uh, uh, sources. What about the export of Chinese coal power technology? Uh, is that compatible with climate neutrality? Uh, there were questions about uh, 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 arms reductions, which I already mentioned. Uh, there was a question uh, about the WHO role, et cetera, et cetera. So you see that uh, we only covered about half of the uh, significant number of questions. In other words, once again, this discussion deserves to be continued. Um, I'm very glad and I want to thank you for participating in this for now an hour and a half of, you, of your time. Um, this is the business of the Munich Security Conference uh, to help uh, eliminate misunderstandings, to help uh, uh, invigorate uh, dialogue. And I'm glad we were able to at least make a small contribution uh, through this event uh, today. Mr. Minister, uh, thank you very much. Thank you also for the interest in the Munich Security Conference and the participation in the conference activities which you personally and many of your colleagues, uh, including uh, one of your important predecessors, uh, Yang Yechi, uh, has shown over, the, uh, over these many years. We are grateful for that and that is the spirit in which we want to continue uh, our cooperation and our discussions. Um, in her absence, I want to thank Federica Mogherini uh, and the um, Atlantic Brücke with Sigma Gabriel. They, they, they both already had to leave. And certainly also your team, uh, your, your wonderful ambassador in Berlin, with whom I had many discussions in recent days and weeks to uh, make detailed arrangements for this. Um, thank you again, Minister. This was a good uh, and useful discussion, even though we know that we don't agree on all issues, but that I think is normal and that is why uh, we need to continue. Thank you very much again. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.